Hi everyone, my name is Andrew and I welcome all of you tonight to the first meeting of the WCSS. I'm uh, very humbled by the fact that so many people have worked here, so for my first meet I've ever, it's quite uh, an achievement. I hope uh, what we're doing here will prove interesting enough to show you that it's worth coming further to the other meetups. And uh, I hope we'll have a good uh, evening tonight. First, let's say, give a big thanks to our host tonight, Ben Corvallon, the Grand Canal, who are, <laughs> who are opened us this uh, marvelous premises. And we've already booked up two more meetups in uh, July and August. So uh, I hope to see you again uh, there. Uh, another sponsor that we have is Sidepoint, which uh, is today represented by one of the authors, uh, the first speaker, William Susan, uh, who also recently launched a book uh, called Jumps at uh, SAS. We'll to come back to Miriam in, a, in just a few moments. And uh, the second guest of the evening will be uh, Chris Coyle. Many people you might know him as the person behind the CSSTricks.com and Copen. He will uh, talk to us about Copen tonight. And uh, that's the schedule that I'm offering to you. So uh, give me a moment, I'll uh, put uh, Miriam on the, on the big screen and we can start. So, uh, I'm Miriam, and uh, if you want to follow along at all, uh, the link to the slides is there, and I'll tweet that afterwards as well, so uh, you can find my slides later. Uh, I'm here because, uh, like Adrian said, uh, I just released this site point book with Hugo, uh, Jumpstart SAS. It's an intro and intermediate guide to SAS. I'm going to be jumping right into chapter nine, which is at the end of the book. Um, because uh, that's what I get excited about. Uh, so uh, follow along and feel free to stop me anytime if you have questions. Uh, I can't see you right now because I can only see my slides, but uh, just yell and I'll stop and uh, answer any questions you have. We'll do a, a small session of questions and answers after your presentation. So uh, Great. please go on. Uh, so uh, we're talking about architecture, um, and the the key to architecture and code, or or patterns in code, uh, is that we want our code to be maintainable, um, and that consists of uh, well consistency, uh, clarity, and efficiency. Uh, the code needs to be read readable, meaningful, um, and efficient to work in. Uh, and maintainability is not only about um, passing it off to somebody else. It's also about coming coming back on my own a year later. Uh, uh, my, my brother has a saying uh, that any code that isn't tested is legacy code. Even if you wrote it yesterday, uh, it's legacy code if you don't have tests, if you don't have documentation. Um, and that's because it's not, uh, the clarity isn't there for coming back and maintaining. So maintainability is important. Uh, both for handoff and for ourselves uh, working in code. And we know some of the basic rules of this separation of concerns, uh, data, content, presentation, the different layers that we have um, with uh, server side and uh, front end. And CSS uh, falls into the presentation category. And uh, these lines are blurry. Uh, they're not always exact. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about what falls on what side of what lines. Um, it's clear that uh, CSS is part of the presentation side of things, um, but where exactly the lines are drawn uh, isn't clear and exact, and it's something that has to be decided project to project, uh, what falls on what side of the lines. But it's important that we're decisive uh, and that we find for our own projects where those lines are uh, because they really do help with maintainability. Um, we're going to be mainly talking about CSS and really SAS, how, how SAS helps with it. But CSS was already designed for making patterns. Um, it's already uh, was intended from the beginning to solve a problem where styles weren't patterned, weren't maintainable, they weren't 
uh, dry. They were very repetitive. Uh, inline styles uh, meant that uh, there was very little maintainability and very little separation between the layers. So CSS exists because we want uh, more maintainable code um, and uh, code uh, that understands patterns. Uh, so a lot of people um, uh, think that CSS is difficult for pattern making, but I think CSS is actually built for it from the ground up. Uh, and that doesn't mean it's always easy. Uh, CSS is a dumb language uh, in some very literal ways. Uh, it is actually, it is not smart. It has no logic. Um, so that's where SAS comes in. Uh, but classes already exist. We already have patterns. Boom. Uh, call to action, background green, larger font. Uh, that's a pattern. Um, and uh, being clear about uh, the organization of patterns in our code, that's the architecture. And that's what we're going to talk about. So CSS also has built in into the title uh, a, the, the beginning of a system for how to approach architecture and organization. Uh, the system is in the name, and that's cascading. Uh, style sheets cascade. And the cascade is about uh, what rules take precedence over what other rules. Um, and a big part of that is specificity. Uh, and specificity is the main guide to any uh, CSS architecture or SAS architecture. <clears throat> I say here to prefer the shallow end. Um, that's referring to Harry Robertson inverted triangle. Uh, and I find this very useful. And uh, you'll find that lots of the uh, lots of the systems that are out there for architecture uh, use similar ideas to this. Um, and this is just following, uh, this, following the cascade, following the specificity of uh, elements. Um, so to stay in the shallow end, we want to stay at the top of the triangle as much as possible. <clears throat> and the top of the triangle is selectors that have a broad reach, uh, very low specificity, and very low explicitness. Uh, the difference between specificity and explicitness is just that specificity is a technical term in CSS. So that's referring to uh, the actual numeric specificity of a selector. An ID has a specificity of 10. Uh, a class has a lower specificity. Uh, data attributes have even lower specificity. So the idea here is that specificity should go up as explicitness goes up. Uh, and as both of those are going up, uh, reach is getting narrower. Uh, so when I want to target a broad category of things, uh, that's often, this is again built into CSS. Classes are thought of as having a broader reach. Uh, and so they have a lower specificity and a lower explicitness. You're targeting, um, well, at the very top, you'd be targeting uh, elements themselves. So an A tag or a P tag or a div. Uh, giving some default styles at the very top. Um, in SAS, we actually have some things that are even above that. Uh, we have uh, function definitions, mix-in definitions, and uh, variable definitions that have no output at all. Um, so those have no specificity and no explicitness uh, and very broad reach. So those are the first. And then you've got uh, the CSS or the HTML tags and then broad classes. Uh, what atomic design would call atoms. Uh, and then you work your way towards the more specific and the more explicit. And those should go together. The more explicit you get, the more specific uh, your selectors can get. <clears throat> Another basic is keeping our code dry. Uh, and again, that's what patterns are for. And that's what classes are for. That's why CSS exists, is to help us have Dry, more dry code. And that stands for don't repeat yourself. We don't want to be saying the same thing over and over again. So if we have multiple call to actions on our website, we want to be able to define once what a call to action looks like and then use that multiple places. On the flip side of that is an acronym that doesn't pronounce as well, just code, um, which I made up last night. Uh, and that just means don't stretch for patterns. 
on the on the flip side of keeping your code dry, there can be a tendency to look for patterns where there aren't patterns. Uh, and that can be dangerous. That can actually get in the way of maintainability. It's OK for some things to be one-offs. It's OK to have something that's unique on your website uh, that's interesting in a design. It's not a problem. So we don't want to stretch for patterns. We want patterns that have meaning and add meaning to the code. So this is not a pattern. These elements share a border style. That does not mean that they're connected. That does not mean that we need to build a pattern for them. Uh, the problem with this is that down the road, uh, when one of them changes, suddenly it's broken the pattern. Uh, and we want the patterns to help with maintainability down the road. So we want something that's more semantic. These elements share a purpose. Um, these are both these are both calls to action, and calls to action are represented by a border style. Then down the road, if we want to make a change to what a call to action looks like, it's not going to break our pattern. Uh, uh, the pattern is already defined by what the what the elements have in common. So this is a better way to think of patterns. And uh, if your patterns aren't lining up to a meaningful purpose, uh, they're fragile. SAS should also add meaning. Uh, and logic is part of how we get there. Uh, logic allows us to show our work. Uh, and at least for me, it was my math teachers all through uh, uh, elementary school telling me that I had to show my work. I couldn't just show the answers. I had to show how I got there. Uh, and that's a really powerful idea. And it's, it's what code is. Uh, when we're writing code, we're writing how you get to the solution of a problem. Instead of writing the solution, we're writing how you get there. Uh, and that's powerful. That's, uh, the code is meaningful to a computer, and it's also meaningful to other developers uh, to be able to see how the problem was solved. Uh, so we want to keep that in mind. So here's just a, an example of old CSS grids. Grids in CSS were a mess. Uh, it was often something floated left and uh, with some padding, with some margin, uh, to try to keep things lined up to the grid. And as you can see, uh, you would have uh, these arbitrary looking numbers, uh, long percentages, if you're doing fluid uh, grid math. Uh, and then you could put in a comment next to it what the math is. <coughs> but that's kind of fragile. Uh, there's no meaning in the code itself. And that was a problem with CSS. Um, uh, and SAS allows us to put that math into uh, its place. Uh, so now we can say, this is actually the math that I'm doing uh, to get the percentage. Still, that's not very readable. That's, uh, that's difficult for a human to understand. Uh, but it's partway there. That gives us uh, some more meaning in our code. And then with a toolkit, you can clean that up farther. Uh, this is an example from Suzy. Um, but you don't necessarily need grids. Um, I don't recommend them for everybody. But here they are, making the code meaningful. And so this is, the, this is the advantage of logic. This is the advantage of patterns and abstractions, is that now we can see this and we can, we can understand what it's doing at a glance. I want to talk a little bit about how we uh, represent abstract patterns in our code, especially because style guides are so popular right now. So we have lots of this uh, going around, wanting to document uh, this abstract idea of a color palette. Um, so here's three colors in my palette, uh, and I want to be able to represent them somehow in my code in a way that is meaningful there as well. I want it to be meaningful not only in the style guide, but in the code itself. So here's one way that people started doing that in SAS uh, with color variables. Um, but uh, they're grouped by, you know, you've got one variable per color, uh, and they've each got, they've got a shared start to the name, color dash dash brand dash orange dash blue dash pink. Uh, and these are useful. We can use these throughout the code, and we're not having to repeat the color everywhere we use it. Uh, we can just call it by name, and we can give them semantic names. Uh, 
we can say this is this is a border color, this is a background color. Um, and we can get some meaningful patterns out of that. The problem that I have with this is that it's not machine readable. The machine doesn't understand that these all go together. Uh, there's no way for the computer to know that uh, everything starting with color is a color. So I like this better, uh, color maps uh, that put the abstract patterns together. And again, we can, we can give them names. Maps also give us the advantage of being able to add and remove colors on the fly. Uh, you can create key value pairs in a way that you can't create variables. Um, but this just tells the computer that all of these brand orange, brand blue, and brand pink, uh, they're not just uh, separate variables that exist. They are part of the same system. Um, so now both a person and a computer can read that grouping. So it's a little bit less uh, less pretty in the way that you call it. You have to use map get uh, with that. So uh, there's some other problems here too. We can't, when we're defining that map, uh, we can't do colors based on other colors because we can't call these functions on a color that doesn't yet exist. Um, at the time that we're trying to, looking here at that gray, trying to adjust the brand blue, uh, brand blue doesn't exist yet because colors hasn't finished defining at the time that we're trying to adjust it. So we get an undefined variable error. So this is a problem with my idea and something I had to solve. This is how I handle it now. Uh, I still use maps, um, but I use it in a way where I'm listing the, the adjustments I will want to make in the map. So I say, I will want to desaturate the blue 80%, but I don't actually do it there. Uh, the math actually happens uh, inside of a color function that I created that helps me call my colors. So this is my solution, my workaround. I, I've been very happy with it because it keeps all the colors in one place, all the description for how each color is calculated in one place. <coughs> A, a simple functional way of calling colors uh, that's clear um, that I'm not just calling any variable, I'm specifically calling a color, uh, and those colors all have to be contained in one place. So anytime a color is added to our system, uh, it's added back in the initial document in the initial map, uh, and all of our colors exist in one place that we can go find them. I like this. Other people think that it's over-engineered. Um, and your mileage will vary. Uh, we also add semantic layers to this. So I'll have brand colors, and then uh, I can have neutral colors and theme colors, uh, different levels of, uh, we generally on a site uh, have sort of what is the brand palette, and then, and then what are the layers of how we're going to actually apply that to our theme? Uh, what is a border color? What is a text color? And then uh, because this is meaningful to humans and computers, uh, we can make documentation the lazy option, which is uh, very helpful for keeping code maintainable. Uh, and to do that, we use SASDoc, which is Hugo's tool, um, and a great way of doing inline documentation uh, that generates a static site um, based on inline comments. Uh, so we do something like this, and we have a little uh, a SAS doc theme that we're working on. It's still very much in alpha that adds some extra features to it. It understands how we do color maps. Uh, so we can say, show me a preview of this color palette, and it automatically generates this site uh, that shows a preview of the color palette. And that's only possible because that color palette is defined in a way that's both human and machine readable. So then we also have a similar tool for setting up scales on our site, uh, sizes of things. Um, you know, what is the root font size? What is uh, the rhythm of the site? Uh, what is small text? Uh, I, what is a gutter? Uh, things like that. How do we do spacing? I'll keep all of those together in a, in a size system. And then I have a type system. What is each font? Um, 
all of the information about a font. And then again, from that, we can automatically generate all of our web font imports, uh, all of our font sizes, uh, and Herman and SAS doc can automatically generate a uh, font specimen for us on our style guide. So right away, just by creating three maps, uh, we have a, a style guide built uh, with all the information about fonts, sizes, and colors. And we haven't had to do anything special to create these manually. And they'll stay up to date as we make changes to our colors and fonts. So that's what I mean about making uh, documentation the lazy option. Uh, here it is, it's built in, it's right in line. Nobody has to do anything special for there to be documentation. Uh, it's just right there. Uh, and that happens because we can automate. It comes with trade-offs and everything is a trade-off. Uh, every decision we make in architecting, uh, when you create one pattern, you're not creating another pattern. Um, uh, patterns uh, put line, put borders, I mean, um, not borders in the CSS sense, but, but you're walling off a certain part of design and that's useful uh, and it's uh, sometimes painful. Um, you're making some decisions over other decisions and you're uh, putting those decisions into a system. Um, so you wanna be careful about what decisions you make and that needs to happen project by project. There are lots of these brand name systems and they're great. Uh, Atomic, uh, Inverted Triangle CSS, SMAX, OOCSS, BEM. These brand name systems are great systems. Uh, they're all really good. They're designed by smart people, but, uh, and they, they have lots of good information. I would read all of them. Uh, they go into detail on specificity and how important it is and uh, how to think about it. Uh, they talk about separation of concerns. Oh, CSS particularly focuses on that one. Um, BEM uh, focuses more on naming conventions, uh, which can be useful. Um, they'll also talk about organizing sash partials. Uh, Hugo has a 7-1 pattern that's very good for that. SMAX talks about depth of applicability, which is an interesting concept to look into, and we talk about it in the chapter. You can find that there. So there's lots of great information in, in these systems, but none of them were designed for your project. None of them were designed with your client in mind or your uh, company, your app. Uh, and your mileage will vary. Uh, different parts of these systems will work well for different projects. Lots of these brand name systems were specifically designed for large enterprise companies. And if that's not the work you're doing, you might get different results and you might find that you need a different system. At Oddbird, this is Oddbird. Well, this was Oddbird. We've grown a little bit, um, both in age and uh, uh, team size. The, there's seven of us now. This is us early on doing a, uh, playing magic, I mean, doing a card sort. Um, uh, we were a team of three siblings. Uh, now we're a little bit larger, but we're still doing client work uh, with a small team and handing it off uh, after usually the MVP. Uh, so that's very different from maintaining uh, large enterprise projects over the long term. So what is the size of your team? What is the structure of your team? How does that affect uh, the systems that you need to build and what you're gonna hand off? Are you internal or are you consulting? How does that affect what you need to build? Uh, sometimes it does make sense to have more of a class-based system uh, where, where more is happening in the HTML with classes. And sometimes it's, it makes sense to be more semantic and you have to find that balance for your own project. And no brand name system is gonna be able to give you the right answer on that. We're all facing very similar problems. We're all dealing with the same uh, underlying technologies, but we all also have unique constraints that are worth paying attention to. <coughs> Excuse me. So I first uh, started thinking about this uh, way back in 2008 when I saw Natalie Down's CSS system stock. And this was just at the beginning of people starting to do CSS frameworks, people trying to make uh, big shared systems for how we write CSS. And Natalie uh, said, no, we don't need frameworks. We need systems uh, that are built for our teams and that we can take from one project to the next. Um, 
But as David Rupert says, uh, they're a tiny bootstrap for every client. Uh, it's not one. It's not one answer that we try to give to everybody. Uh, but we have sort of a system for building systems uh, for each project uh, that can be unique uh, and custom suited to that project. <coughs> and when you're doing that, toolkits are the byproduct. Um, so for us, Accoutrement and Herman uh, and Susie, those are byproducts from uh, just trying to get our code more organized and more clean. Um, and as soon as we stopped using grids, we stopped using Suzy. Uh, and that's OK. Uh, the toolkits aren't the driving force behind uh, a project. The toolkits should be the result of a project. Uh, wh while you're developing, toolkits can be generated uh, to help with your system. And the tools should fit you. Uh, it's crazy uh, to think that you would have a hammer that only builds patio chairs. Uh, and sometimes I feel like that's how our frameworks look. Uh, our toolkits build one thing, and we just have to build that thing over and over again, uh, changing the color of the paint. <coughs> and that doesn't seem reasonable to me. Um, for an example, here's just a, a very small tool that I built at one point. I wanted uh, equal height, responsive, CSS-only tabs. These are using. Um, uh, check boxes or radio inputs uh, to do the switching, um, which is clever and fun. Uh, I wasn't using this on a client project. I was doing this for myself. And I built myself a mix-in that would make tabs. And it was very long, as you can see. It's uh, a lot going on here uh, with lots of, lots of logic and lots of options. Uh, and I used it once, and then I tried to use it again somewhere else, and I realized it was too specific, and it only allowed me to build the same thing over and over again. And that's not useful. I don't need the same thing uh, on every site or even on uh, every every instance on one site. So I trimmed it down to once essential. There's only one thing that's special happening in there, and that's hiding the input and then changing some content based on whether it's checked or not. And that's it. So this is the mix-in that remains. And I've used it other places. This one is flexible. This is a tool that doesn't tell me what my site should look like. Uh, it just gives me a useful tool that I can, I can build uh, anything from tabs to accordions uh, to uh, summary and details. And over engineering, that wasn't a problem. Uh, that that was over-engineered the first time. That's a good first step. That's where we start. Uh, and an, uh, an agile process, which is popular these days, uh, that lets us get things wrong. Uh, that's the point. Uh, when we have to refactor our code, it's not because there was a problem. It's because that's actually how we work. Uh, it's useful to do things wrong and then fix them uh, as long as that uh, cycle is happening. So we want to build our own damn system uh, for our project and uh, using ideas. There's no right answer to any of these questions, uh, but having no answer is totally wrong. Uh, we need to find answers. Uh, we just don't, they just don't need to be universal. We don't need to argue that our answer is right for everybody or even for all of our own projects. Thank you. Hey, how's it going? Thanks a lot, by the way, it's really good. Um, I was going to ask, do you have an opinion on mixing patterns together? So um, the reason I'm asking is, we use like an object-oriented CSS style throughout our site, and we have a 12-span grid that works well and we're happy with it. And just because we saw you were doing the talk this month, a couple of weeks ago we integrated some of the Suzy stuff, <coughs> and we did a painter building, and it worked really well. It was for a page where we had to have 17s across and 12 span grid wouldn't fix that. But now my worry is that we've got almost all of our layout in object orientation style and a very small amount of it mix-ins in the CSS. 
And it strikes me like that's a bad idea, but I, I, it feels like a bad idea, but I can't really put my finger on why. Have you had any experience with that? Or? Uh, I would say that, that I, and I can't hear really well, so uh, let me know if I uh, got the question wrong. Okay. Um, but um, I would say it's dangerous uh, if uh, you don't know the system between the two, right? Uh, it's fine to use different tools and have different systems uh, to solve different problems. That's useful. Uh, but if you don't know why uh, this part is using OLCSS and this part is using mixins, uh, that can get risky. So what's more important than making sure you only have the one tool is making sure that you know why you're using each pattern in each place uh, and that there's some consistency to that. Uh, and that's what I would focus on. Okay, cool. Cheers. Well, I guess we can wrap up this presentation. Thank you so much, Miriam, for your uh, uh, presence here tonight. <laughs> I'll make sure to send you all the recordings and pictures that I got, provided they end up well. Otherwise, I'll just put them under the rock, never to see the light again. Thank you again, and uh, have a good day there over, over the pond. And hopefully we might see you again at our presentations. And who knows, maybe live, not just through the screen. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so I guess that's the first part. Give me two moments to get in touch with Chris, and we'll continue with the second part. And uh, those books will give them after we finish, so that we don't keep people waiting for us to, to call. Thank you. OK, let's see. You're live. So again, people, we have Chris Coyer live on Skype today. Tonight, Chris, you can start. Yeah. All right. How you doing, Dublin? Like I said, never been, but this is it's, it's fun to be here. I was kind of hoping to, uh, I don't know, talk to you all about. Fr is this is the this is the, the 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 front end club, as it were, in Dublin? Yeah. Yes, it is. Cool. Well, is there anything that you want to talk about specifically, or you want to? Uh, Know anything from me? How do you want to do it? <laughs> yeah, everybody wants to know all about you. So <laughs> let, let's stick to a topic, uh, something that is nice and dear to your heart. Comparing what would means for a front-end developer. I know that you you love talking about Codepen recently, so uh, let's start with that. Yeah, well, I mean, if anybody doesn't know what it is, it's CodePen.io, and it's kind of a project that came. It's it's getting it's getting a little old. It's like four and a half years old now. Which, when I think back on it, it's like, wow, I can't believe it has kind of gone that fast. But it's a uh, uh, it's a playground for front end development. So it's kind of, you know predating it are tools like JS Bin and JS Fiddle. You look at one screen and it covers the whole screen, and you have an opportunity to write HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and then see like as you type the results of what you're creating, which is uh, uh, can be can be kind of empowering, you know, for for lots of people for lots of different reasons. So my like my elevator pitch for CodePen has been like really bad over the years. I'm like, uh, it's kind of like a I don't know, it's an editor in the browser, and it's a social network kind of for developers. And I don't know, some people use it just when they're having problems and like go there to put the code in and have an example that they can show somebody that's of something that's broken or, or whatever. There are people, lots of people that use it for totally different reasons. There's professors using it. There's like uh, uh, coding schools that use it to teach through. And so I don't know. There's you know any reason that you might want to write some front end code, uh, 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 you can do that on CodePen, for some degree or another. And it kind of came to be from 
from mostly because I thought JS Fiddle was really sweet <laughs> back in the day. So I also work on uh, a, a blog about front end web development, CSS Tricks, CSS-Tricks.com. And there would be like forever, I'd like make a demo and be like, look at this, this is a cool thing that you can do with web design. Uh, and here's some HTML of how it works, and here's some CSS of how it works. And if you want to see it, I guess click this link and go look at a demo of it over here. And the demo would be like a, a page that didn't have anything else on it. It was just like just the demo of what I'm trying to show you to build. But it's like then you have to like leave the blog post to go look at it and you can't really like see the code at the same time unless you view source or whatever. And I'm like, you know, it started to be when, you know, when JS Fiddle came around, it was like starting to be like really obvious that like that's a nice way to show code. It's like go look, go look at this demo over here because then you can see the code and the result of it all together. And you can change it and see how those two things are related. And mostly it was like started to put more and more demos on it because it was like this is really nice. They really have solved an interesting problem here. I want this too, but just like anything, I'm sure you've come across this before in your jobs and stuff. When you rely too heavily on a and on a, like another third party service, it's a little risky, right? Like if I just put every single demo on the entire CSS tricks on JS Fiddle, it would feel weird. I mean, it probably wouldn't have been a problem knowing what I know now. They're, they've been around and they've been doing fine, which is great. Uh, but it's risky. Like, what if it were to shut down? I would have abandoned all my demos. That would be a problem. Or what if they, like, went with some feature direction that I didn't like? You know, that would be a problem. And I was like, maybe I should just build my own. Even if I build my own and it's worse, at least I, I control it, you know? Maybe I can, I don't know, design it how I want to and have features that I want to and stuff. So that's kind of, that was the beginning of CodePen was, was, was I want to build like my own version of, of JS Fiddle or JS Bin and do what I want to do with it. Uh, so that's what we did. And so early on, you know, made it so every, anything that you build on CodePen can also be embedded elsewhere. Uh, that was one of the first features we built because I wanted it for myself. I'm sure many of you have ideas that you're building, you know, to kind of a scratch your own itch situation. I always think that's kind of funny when startups are like, I built it to just scratch my own itch, you know, it's like a sound bite for startups and you're like, yeah, I hope so. I hope you're building something that, that you like and that you'll use. That's where it came from. Um, yeah, and embeds, you know, they've, they've grown up over time. It was just a couple weeks ago we released a version of embedded pens that allow you to, um, uh, to, to take the editability. Like when you're on CodePen and you type, oh, I'm going to change red to green and you see the result of that. We've taken that editability and put it in the, the embedded pens feature so that like you don't even have to come to CodePen to get that, that kind of functionality, which is nice for like, it's nice for CSS tricks and it's nice for, uh, you know, there's like like some SVG charting library or something that will use us to uh, to put their demos on their site, and they you know they'd prefer to just leave people over there, and so it kind of serves that need, which is kind of cool. Anyway, does anybody uh, use CodePen for anything interesting that I don't know about, or have questions about how it works? Yeah, I can hear okay. you. A okay. little. Oh, that's better. That's better right there. Yeah, yeah. I was hoping that the other microphone will pick the uh, surround one. So uh, I, I can't uh, really brag about my own CodePen account because oh, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's really <Yeah>. awful. <laughs> exactly as I said, I'm using it for demos. And uh, recently I just uh, built, rebuilt one of uh, exercises that I did years ago. but. I really can't compare it with some that you have in the gallery on the front page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of like, that's, that's, that's okay, you know, like I said at the beginning, people use it for different things, you know, and it, and it actually kind of makes me a little sad when people are like, oh, I can't, I can't use CodePen because I can't do the things that I see other people use on there. I'm like, I, that doesn't matter, you know, like we, we have the homepage for fun, so you can see like all the interesting stuff that's, that's happening on CodePen, but like you don't have to use CodePen like that. There's no prescriptive way to use CodePen. You don't have to be like, like, well, oh, I see all this stuff on the homepage. Is, look, a lot of it looks like art, you know? It looks like 
you know, basically code artists doing stuff with Canvas and uh, and SVG and WebGL and crazy stuff like that. I mean, that's just that's just because it looked it's nice to to see on the homepage. There's some visual component of it, and it makes for kind of a compelling place to land on it. But but you know. It, Personally, like I can't do any of that stuff either. You know, I'm attracted to it. I'm like, whoa, nice! Look at that spinning circle madness. You know, I'm way into it, and I and I and I pick those. Uh, but you know, I I can't I can't compete. I'm, I'm I'm you know the pens that I'm most interested when I look through and uh, make picks for the homepage are things that like you know people exploring you know web layout in interesting ways and doing cool things with typography and. Uh, I don't know. It's just interesting, more like normal front end effects, like interface in animation. In yeah, you know, I just I like get a kick out of that stuff. Well, most because that's what I do. That's what I build. So if I see like you know some like really cool way to open a modal dialog box or something, I'm like, ooh, I could use that. You know, like if, if you, I think if people get that like, ooh, I could use that feeling, that's like good. You know. That's, That's like, like what, what you're what, what you're, you're most attracted, attracted to. So, so. Yeah, yeah, you know, not, not everybody has like beautiful, beautiful, beautiful code pen home pages for themselves. You know, in fact, fact, like I work, I work with, with a guy, guy Tim Savitt, who's who's, who's like, like our, our database, database and server guy, guy and stuff. And that's, that's what, what he, he likes, likes to work on. He's a super smart guy that that is really into code pen in the community and building stuff for it and thinking about it and ways to make it better. But he's just not a particularly visual guy and you know his code pen his account is mostly full of like embarrassing tester pens where he's trying to like test to make sure some feature is working or like it literally just says test in the HTML and that's his pen and I've always been like oh come on dude you can do better than that but you know that's that's code pen to him uh, I'd say most people don't have like don't use it in that like personal portfolio kind of way. It certainly can be that, but it's yeah, it doesn't have to be. I have I'd say I don't know, third of my pens are like this is broken. I need to figure out how to fix this kind of thing. I want to show somebody something that I think is kind of broken, whether it, whether it's broken because of my own understanding of how it works or it's uh, something broken about CodePen or something broken about how a web browser is interpreting something. I think that's a pretty compelling way to use it. Okay, I think let's try and pick some questions from the people. Come on. <laughs> See, they're, they're so afraid of you, they even left the, the first two rows <laughs> empty. They're afraid that you might buy them or me. No, that's okay. <laughs> okay, then tell us some, something else interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, so let me pick from my pile of interesting things. Um, I can tell you one thing that I'm pretty, you know, just I, I hate to make this like a sales pitch for CodePen, but that's what it was, for, you know, that's the, what I hope to talk about a little bit, because uh, it's the thing that I work on like all day, every day for the most part. Um, you know, teachers use it sometimes. There's like, you know, there's literally universities that are trying to teach through it and uh, all the way down to really young people. Uh, there's a there's a here in the United States. There's the Girl Scouts. I don't know if there's Girl Scouts in in Ireland or not. There's probably some version of it. It's just you know they learn how to I don't know go camping and <laughs> stuff so like that. I don't even know what Girl Scouts learn, but they learn like a variety of life skills that they that they do. And one of them, even in in mo like modern day Girl Scouts. Uh, learn to build websites. It's one of the, like the badges you get is like to learn it. And there's been there's been Girl Scout workshops put together to teach them HTML and CSS and make little websites together. And uh, some of the 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 Girl Scout troops that are that are working on that ha have started in CodePen a little bit. Uh, which is cool. So they, they come in and they have to like ma they end up making a website for Beyonce or something. Like they they pick one of their favorite like stars and they make a website uh, for them. And like many of us, our first website ever was probably like a home page, an about page, and a contact page or something, right? You have, and you like it has a header and it says why you like them. Maybe it has a big photo of them and some quote that they said or something like that. And it's and it's easy and. Uh, uh, so we've heard from the leaders that teach these like Girl Scout troops like, oh, it was great. You know, first we started in Sublime Text and had them do that. And we had them make like about.html. And we had them make a style.css. And we linked them all together. And 
And they were kind of getting it, but it's a little awkward, you know? Like, like especially young people today that maybe their only computer experience is with, like, an, uh, you know, their Android phone or their iPad or whatever. There's not really, like, a file system and a file system is like a weird, a weird concept. So when they're like, you know, they're like, eh, actually, we just switched over to CodePen, and then it was a lot easier for them. They could understand like the connection between the code they were writing and, and what they were trying to build. It just made a lot more sense. But then, and we're was like, yeah, that's great. Heck yeah, let's get kids started young on this HTML stuff. Then they, uh, then they're like, well, we had to leave because we wanted. On an about page, a contact page, and the home page, and on CodePen, there's really no way to do that. There's you can't have like multiple HTML files, uh, which is kind of sad. So like, after they had this great moment where they were like, you know, this was making a lot of sense for all the people using it, and that's what we hear over and over that like the fact that you don't have to download any software, or have a file system or, or anything is 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 nice. Then they had to leave and go back to Sublime Text because they wanted to have multiple HTML files. So that's a long setup to say that we're going to have it both ways pretty soon. It probably will take us a couple months to get there, but we're like deep, deep in development on a new feature on CodePen that we're calling the Projects Editor that is like more like Sublime Text in the browser. You get a sidebar, and it's full of files, and you can just click to add new ones and drag and drop them around and name them whatever you want. and. So it's more like real world web development, but inside CodePen. So you'll be able to go new project instead of new pen and just have a more real world thing where you can use, you know, JavaScript modules and SAS partials and, and all the normal stuff that you're used to being able to do as a, as a front end web developer, you know, uh, in there, which is kind of going to be great, I think. And we'll probably make it so you can like publish a website just like, a, like GitHub pages or whatever. So yeah, like nobody's really seen it yet. Brand new. I haven't told any meetups about it yet, but uh, uh, I should say if anybody like wants in and wants to test on that, to shoot me an email at chris at codepen.io and I'll put you on the beta list and you can play with it as soon as it's ready. But I think it's going to be kind of cool, you know. Like I just like if you want to build something, a modern thing, and you want to build it just like you do on localhost or whatever on your own computer, you'll be able to do that on CodePen. We'll, we'll give you the file system and the, the little the playground to run it with. For those of us digital nomads, it will be easier than to just have all the projects in one place instead of actually having to switch from laptop to tablet, back to laptop, back to tablet, and so on. Yeah, that's a good point too, is that, yeah. I mean, that's why a lot of us use GitHub and anything is, you know, the importance of, you know, I have a laptop I'm sitting and talking into right now that it's like not all that important. Like if I spilled my Coke on it right now, that would be sad, but I could, you know, I could, I could get the insurance money, buy a new laptop, pull down all my repos again and be okay. Of course, all my stuff on CodePen is fine. I find that it's happened to me and I find that very liberating that, that the, I don't do very much with, with my machine. I don't care about that. I care about What's up, you know, in the cloud, as they say. <laughs> Plenty of clouds here in Ireland. So. <laughs> <laughs> Is there? <laughs> ah, cool. So what's, what's, what was the, what was the, what was the first talk about? Not that, I mean, I know you already had it, but I'm kind of okay, interested. So Miriam in talked to us about uh, making up patterns and setting up with the architecture of projects and how to use patterns, when to use them, when not to use them. Nice. And, I should have. I feel like I should have prepared an actual talk for you then. <laughs> uh, I can tell you, I've been really into to SVG stuff. Um, I don't have anything prepared to look at necessarily, but I have some cool collections I could send around for stuff to look at. I have a. Uh, I've been particularly into it because I have a book coming out soon that's going to be called Practical SVG. That's all about using SVG in front-end web development, and mostly because I like you know. On CSS tricks and CodePen, as I build those sites, you know anything that's vector art, I'm like, this should be SVG, and we've kind of gone all in on it on all sites I've been building recently. So, pretty excited about that. Introduce us your partner from behind you. What's that? Maybe introduce us to your partner behind you. Yeah. Your dog. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> he came out doing, while you were talking very excitingly and he just yeah. wanted to be online as well. <laughs> yeah. 
It's all right. We just went so for a walk we right have a before. Of questions. Now people gather their courage and. Well, yeah, you know, I love talking about, about stuff. stuff. Um, hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I work in a small startup, and we use um, preprocessor for CSS and handlebar, for example, for structuring and coffee scripts, for example. But um, I have an idea of what um, I use, like in, this, in small companies. But what, what does like um, CSS tricks and code pen, code pen? You know, you are like uh, big sites. What I would like to know what you use for like the structure and the style and um, functionalities because in CSS tricks you use CSS to, to explain people how to use CSS and I would like what I would like to know what you use to build the actual site itself CSS tricks is um, it's not that fancy I feel like it's uh, you know I primarily it's a WordPress site and we're, you know, and o over time, there's been different pieces of it. I used to, like, there's forums, for example, on CSS tricks that used to be something called PHPBB or something. And then I switched over to some other thing called Vanilla Forums or something. And then, and then over time, I was just like, God, I wish this could just be all WordPress. Uh, and, and, and WordPress now has finally, like, a, a nice grown-up forum software called BB Press. So I was very happy to, to get that into place. And, or I used to like sell products and I'd be like, ah, oh, we should just make a Shopify store. And then over time I was like, I'd really love to pull that into WordPress too. So now we use um, whatever the popular e-commerce thing is for WordPress. So, you know, right now CSS Tricks is like 100% WordPress. Like every URL on the entire site is powered by WordPress. And that feels good to me. Uh, finally, just because it's so, it's just easier to keep all your assets together and treat everything the same way and make sure everything is kind of under one roof. So, like, structurally, I do use, you know, I, I don't use any, like, themes or anything. I just, like, a long time ago learned how WordPress works and just kind of make my own, my own themes for it. Uh, but I do use SAS for, for, the, for, for, the, for the CSS portion of it. And it's not, you know, it's not that fancy. I, I you know, it's... I don't use CSS modules or anything super modern or anything. I just kind of like use SAS like I would use CSS. I, I uh, break things into partials that make sense to me and then, you know, write SAS such that it's, it's kind of the output is how I would write the CSS if I wasn't using any preprocessor at all. But since I do break it into partials, I tend to break it into like, all right, I, I'm going to make one that's just for layout because I just think that's comfortable from how I work. And one that's just for typography, uh, and a couple other things that 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 formulate like all of the uh, uh, you know the structure of the site really. And then it, and then so sometimes I have to break it down by section of the site. So I'm like, okay, this is like stuff that's just just for a blog post specifically. Like, what does code look like? What do figures look like within it? And that uh, maybe I'll have a CSS file that's just for comments. So it's just kind of a chunk of CSS that I know is just for the comments area. That's what it's for. Uh, maybe the header, maybe the footer, maybe the sidebar. I don't know. And then and then like 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 style.css, which is the global style sheet that just gets applied everywhere, just pulls in all of those partials together and, and combines it into one style sheet. It's not that complicated of a site where there needs to be multiple style sheets, really. So structurally, it's just like however I feel like breaking it apart and it all gets smashed together. I was kind of surprised. It's not, it's on larger projects that I've worked on over time, it's not always how I've worked. It's, it's, not, it's been like, yeah, we'll have a global style sheet, but then there'll also be well, because we're in the editor area of the site, we'll also have like editor CSS that just goes with that. So I tend to always been like, there's global, and then there's at least one other style sheet that complements it that's specific to that area of the site. And I feel like in the past few years, it's like gone out of favor to have multiple CSS files. I've learned while you know asking other big companies how they do it, and they're like, "Not, nah, we just smash everything together. If we have to break it, if we have to break it into multiple files, 
Uh, we only do it because of like the size of the file is so big that we've learned like for performance reasons it's good to just split it in half for some reason. But like GitHub, for example, is like one style sheet. Every bit of styling, I mean, there may be some exceptions to it these days, but as of like last year, every single style that goes to every single page of everything on GitHub was just one giant style sheet and they shipped it and just let the browser cache it and that was that. So it's like, wow, that's okay. That's wild. But. So CSS structurally, that's what I've been leaning more towards these days. Just smash it all into one big old style sheet and, and go, you know? The chances of it being like so huge that it's unmanageable is, is low, I think, you know? Ain't nobody have like two megabyte style sheets, you know? I think if that's your problem, that's a, that's a thing. Okay, we'll see questions. Yeah, I, so I, I'm not sure if I got all of that, but it's kind of like, is, are you kind of asking if you think front end is like, is kind of the future and that maybe building websites entirely through the front end is the, might be the way where the world is headed? Yeah, I see what you mean. Like, yeah, uh, I feel like long, long term, you know, five years maybe that, yeah, that's kind of inevitable. It's not like my play at CodePen. I'm not trying to be like a, I see the future in my crystal ball and I'm building a company so that we'll be well positioned to be that company. That's not really where my mind is at. But I do think that like, the web gets better and better and all the time. The network gets better and better all the time. The desire to just, you know, have things work online, it's going to get better and better. I feel like inevitably it will, that, that is where things will go. At the moment, it's not there yet. Like, I want to make CodePen as powerful as it can be and feel good as a development environment and stuff, but like, I don't see it replacing you know, Sublime Text or, you know, and Sublime Text is like a lightweight one. I'm sure a lot of you use like bigger, more robust IDEs that do way more. And there's just certain things that the web just isn't as well suited to do quickly, I think, that a desktop app is just always going to do better because it has access to, uh, you know, a faster processor locally and stuff like that. For example, I know one of the, one of the struggles with with online IDEs is like find in project. You know, I'm sure a lot of you work on projects where there's like thousands of files. And if you're in Sublime Text, you can hit, you know, find in project and you look for some name of a function and just instantaneously it shows you all the results of that. That's hard to pull off on the web. I don't, I don't know that you're gonna get that kind of like instantaneous feedback and like indexing of your project that, that quickly. And, 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 and I don't think developers are ever like really willing to like step backwards in the ability of their development environment. They're, I think is it, it like, there's some, I don't know, you know, like you try one out. You're like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go try it. I'm gonna go try Cloud9 or whatever, one of these online IDEs. And as soon as you find something you don't like, you're like, I don't like it, I'm, I'm out. I'm going back to what I'm comfortable with, you know? I think there's like a reluctance to, to jump into stuff like that when you when when you start noticing things that bother you, I think developers are just picky about that and and probably rightfully so. But long term, is that where it's headed? Yeah, I probably I think so. Okay, one more question here. Uh, hi there. Thanks for talking to us. Uh, question about the SVG. Is there any library that you use and you recommend? Uh, and how do you deal with uh, browser support? 
just well, there's lots of SVG based JavaScript libraries for sure. I mean, D3 is a really common one that probably a lot of people have heard of. That it's pretty, it's pretty cool. It's pretty comfortable. It's like rather than writing SVG by hand or like exporting SVG from something like Illustrator, it's a programmatic approach to SVG. So you can be like, make me a circle, make it with these attributes, animate it to this, and you know, loop over this data set and and do something, draw, draw rectangles based on the data you find and stuff. I think D3 is like, I don't know, sometimes you go to the D3 homepage and you're like, this is crazy, I can't do this. But the, like, the raw APIs of D3 are, are pretty cool and, 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 and it's still being developed. I think, I think there's like a 4.0 of D3 is, is, is like in beta and, and looks pretty cool. So like, you know, if you like are interested in programmatic library to help you draw and, and manage uh, stuff. D3 is pretty good. If you come from a front-end development background and you really like jQuery, if you're like buried in jQuery, like, God, I wish I could, you know, play with and build and manipulate SVG just exactly like I do everything else in jQuery, Snap SVG is an awesome library for that, I find. Uh, and then if you're specifically interested in animating SVG and then animating anything else on the web. I think the go-to library is GreenSock, which is you know it just has very. It's just you know, every time you use it, you're like, wow, it's amazing. Any time I tell any piece of thing to move or change color or resize or reshape, it's so smooth. It's so performant and so cross-browser friendly that uh, yeah. So Snap SVG for the jQuery like manipulation and movement and stuff. Green sock for animation and D3 for like a programmatic approach to building SVG. I think those are my three favorites. Thank you. We'll take two more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Hi, Chris. This is again. Uh, first of all, I want to say I love CodePen. I use it every day. But I sometimes struggle when it comes to trying new tools or technologies. I don't know. You want to build something with React or something. Where did you get your inspiration from? Do you have something in your pile of interesting things that you could share? Sure. Just anything that's interesting lately. Or are you trying to like? Are you having trouble using new technologies in CodePen? No, I was just wondering where do you, do you get your inspiration? I don't know from your dog or something like that. <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't know. I mean, a lot of times what we build on on CodePen is 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 specifically like uh, we see people wanting to do a certain thing and just try to build the thing for them. You know, the inspiration comes from the people using it, so we kind of lucked out in that way, and that it's it's easy. I don't need any divine inspiration to to know what people want. They just tell us what they want, you know, for the most part. Uh, combined with our own vision for like, you know, like I build websites. What can I build for me to help build me websites, you know? Uh, it comes it comes pretty easy. And, and I luck out. I get to come to and hang out at meetups like this, and I get to go to conferences, and I just, I feel like I, ha I try to, you know, and then through CSS Tricks and the community that happens there, I get to keep a pretty good bead on, on kind of the conversation around around web development. Dear, and I, uh, dear Chris, I want for this Christmas this feature in CodePen, no? Do you get letters like that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I wish we had a better way to, 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 for you to give us those things. I mean, Twitter is a great way. I don't know how many of you are all on Twitter, but it's like we, we look at every single tweet that has CodePen in it. We have like a whole system for managing it across our whole team. So like if you say like, oh, I wish CodePen could do this, we'll see it for sure. And we use Trello to track ideas internally. So like, and we're really good at jotting down all ideas. So if it ever comes time like, okay, we're going to work on this now, we have this Trello board, which is full of links to tweets and stuff of like what people have wanted and asked for around that particular particular subject. So all that stuff is, is managed and we listen to everything for sure. We have public things, but it's mostly for bugs. Like we have a GitHub repo that's just like bug reporting only. Uh, and we try to keep it that way because in the past we've had, we've had our, our uh, GitHub issues full of, of a combination of both bugs and ideas. And it really was a mess. I don't recommend that. <laughs> separate, separate your idea stuff and your actual bug stuff. Uh, definitely. Uh, and yes, React is very cool. React is definitely going to win, I decided. 
Uh, hi there. Um, I got two quick questions. Uh, one is how many people you have uh, behind the strings and code pen? Um, and the other one is um, being your, I guess, your main public uh, developers, you know, you kind of get curious sometimes and trying to break things and things like that. Are you having any security issues or things like that? And, in terms of that, especially when talking about doing something like, you know, giving uh, uh, free access on an editor like Sublime or something like that, uh, make sense? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, we can we can figure that stuff out uh, or talk about it in a minute. The teams, the team at CSS Tricks kind of flows up and down, but at the moment, I think there's four or five, maybe six uh, writers, and they and by writers it means like they just sometimes they write some articles, sometimes they write link posts, sometimes they help me out with the the newsletter. Uh, sometimes they just edit articles or help me find other guest posts who are experts in things to write. So like. Uh, yeah, and they're all everybody's part time at CSS Tricks. We don't have any any full timers, um, and, and that's that. So it, you know, it used to be just me for a long time, and then I decided to you know take a risk and pay some people to help me out, and that's that. I think it was mostly a good decision. You know, well, we'll I'll probably always have some people helping me out in some regard or another on, on CSS Tricks. It's just nice to have more minds on a project, as I'm sure you all know. It's it's easier to work with a team than it is to work alone for the most part. Uh, and there's nine total people at CodePen. Uh, seven people that write code in some capacity, and then a uh, finance person and somebody that helps out with uh, uh, like shipment of stuff, swag, and you know managing stuff like that, meetups and things. Uh, and you know one of the and Marie, who's on support, uh, I I count her definitely as somebody who writes code for us because uh, there's probably at least a couple of commits from her every day of of something that we screwed up, whether it's a, you know, a spelling thing or just some UI thing that needs to be adjusted. Uh, it's kind of nice. It's, not, it's so great having support people that just, that are also, you know, have full access to your repo too, so they can fix stuff they need to fix. So yeah, it's like, it's like seven at CSS Tricks, nine at CodePen as far as numbers. Hopefully those numbers go way, way up. <laughs> First we need to make some money though, so sign up for pro account. <laughs> the questions on the site. And then there was some security stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. he was asking of, of how do you, have you had any attempts to be, to, for the website to be hacked or how do you deal with that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. sort of well, thing. not so much hacked. I mean, there probably is people trying to hack CodePen, but I don't, I don't know. I'm not, there hasn't been anybody like, who, who has been like, I got your entire user database. You're screwed now kind of thing. It's, that's usually not the attack vector on CodePen. Usually it's more like, I found a way to use CodePen to do XSS or, or spammers using it or somebody trying to DDoS us or something. It's less people trying to break in and more like people trying to abuse CodePen in some way. And there's a good amount of that. There's a lot of spam. As a matter of fact, almost every week we have to be working on our spam tools. Uh, in some way or another to catch more of it and to prevent more of it and to make it easier for the for us who have to uh, hop in and and, and uh, do some manual curation of what's spam and what's not working on the tools to make that better that's just part of the thing unfortunately when you have any kind of product that allows user generated content spammers are going to try to mess with it and uh, and that's and it sucks but it's just a part of it's a part of the job I don't mind building it because it means like the better job we do with it, you know, not to be too competitive, but, but uh, you know, if a competitor comes along and wants to make a serious play in this market, they're going to have to, they're going to have to put in the anti-spam work just like we have. And it's unglamorous work. It's hard, sucky work. And the more you do of it, the more, you know, the more valuable CodePen becomes because we have really robust spam fighting tools. We also use, I think it's called Bug Crowd. It's like a, it's its own service that you sign up for and then you kind of say, hey, we're, we're out there to like reward people in some way if you find vulnerabilities on CodePen. And I can say it's a mixed bag. It's not, it's not perfect because there's tons and tons of like, like uh, uh, I don't know, for lack of a better word, script kitties on Bug Crowd that 
they found some script that they can run that tests security vulnerabilities on your site and then they report them through bug crowd and then are hoping for some kind of reward of some sort and they try they try their best they're incentivized to tell you that the sky is falling and your you know your entire application and livelihood and future of being a web app is at risk you know the more scary they make it sound for you the you know the 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 higher chance you have of trying of, of taking them seriously and stuff so it's there's a lot of that which sucks to deal with but it's worth it because some people really do find actual bugs in your software and 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 that's valuable and you need to reward those people in some way or another so it's nice to have a, a product out there that deals with that for you so you don't you're not I don't know. So the expectations are set. You say this is what you get if you report a bug to CodePen, rather than like sometimes they attempt to even the worst of them try to take ransom. You know, they're like, they're like, I'll tell you about this bug, but first you have to, I don't know, send me two hundred dollars or give me a free account or you know, it's a wild world out there. The security testing stuff. There's, there's lots of slimy people, but then the people who aren't slimy that are good people, they they find it hard to cut through all the slime which is too bad because those people are amazingly valuable. You know, the nice people that want to actually help you make your application more secure. And there's so many ways on CodePen for us to screw up. Not only just the regular web app stuff, but we allow you to run, execute node through preprocessors and execute Ruby through some of our preprocessors and stuff. And that stuff is really dangerous, you know. I think a classic web security thing is don't allow people to execute arbitrary code on your website. That's like rule number one. And CodePen is like, here's a, you know, here's a web app for running execu for executing arbitrary code. Anyway, it's a weird, wild world. We fight, we fight it every day. Okay, thank you so much, Chris, for joining us tonight and for explaining some of the unglamorous parts of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what happens behind the scenes? And, uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There's a, there's a lot of you there. That's awesome. Um, I hope to visit one day and meet you in person. We will we we'll wait for, for that moment. Thank you so much. Thanks. 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 I think he says goodbye as well. Yeah. <laughs> Take care. Okay, so first prepare to wrap this up. We are going to do something that I was planning initially to do between the two presentations. Uh, we have three books, uh, three opinion books that uh, were given to us, and we're going to raffle them for those of you who put the, <laughs> the tickets. That was the purpose. So I'm going to ask our host as an impartial party to help us pick up three numbers. <laughs> Number 19. <laughs> <laughs> Number 30. Okay. And the last one. 44. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who's 45? Oh. <laughs> so, ladies first. Thank you again. Any of you, if you have any questions or 
you can either speak now or you can send me messages on the meetup or uh, email, whatever you think it's uh, more familiar. Thank you again for coming here tonight.